before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. do to get to us, but what will we be willing to do to get to him? Praise the Lord. We want to be able to have that same desire towards the Lord. Appreciate Gracie tonight singing for us. Today is Gracie's birthday. It's the big 12, so happy birthday, Gracie. Birthday. Amen. This time our children and our teenagers can be dismissed, and if you have a missions offering, you can bring that and place it in the offering plate at this time as well, as uh, they are being dismissed, you can take and turn in your Bible um, several places, but let's just start with Matthew 17. So Matthew chapter 17, 
and we're going to look at verse 20. We'll move to a couple other places. All right, let's pray for Sister Debbie. She passes her test. Matthew 17 and verse 20. We talk about tonight as we continue our series on prayer. Nothing shall be impossible. Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be possible unto you. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the enrichment and the power and strength that we get and receive from your word. And I pray, God, just speak to hearts tonight, God, as your disciples came to you and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Oh, if we could learn how to pray, if we could un understand and realize the importance of prayer, oh, we can accomplish much more than what we're seeing in our lives today. And I pray, God, that you just help us and anoint us to deliver this message, to receive this message, but also to be men and women of prayer. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Nothing shall be impossible. Last week we talked about seeing God. And this week we want to talk about what happens once you have had that Isaiah 6 experience. Nothing shall be impossible with you. Understand something tonight, that prayer is the most powerful weapon that God has given us as the church. Amen? Prayer is the most powerful weapon that we have in our arsenal, yet it's the most neglected in the entire arsenal. It's the most powerful weapon, but the least used. And so we see here in our text tonight, in the 17th chapter of Matthew, uh, leading up to this text is account of a young boy who was vexed with the devil, and the disciples were unable to cast him out, so they asked Jesus why they were not able, and that was our text was Jesus' reply in, that te in our text. He said this, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Then we see in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, he said, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint. That men ought to always pray to pray and not faint. So that word faint here in this, in this uh, text in Luke 18 verse 1, it's better translated as stop. And so we have to understand something. We cannot stop until we get an answer. We, we, can, we cannot just stop praying because we have got tired or we felt that God didn't hear us or we've, whatever stops us from praying. We cannot do that. Don't stop until you get an answer. And then we find over in Mark chapter 6, verse 56, it said, And whithersoever he entered into a village or city or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. And as many as touched him, were made whole. Now, all of this implies something to us. Remember when we talked about faith, we said belief plus action equals faith. And, and so we, we've said here, we see here in these three verses that we've used in, in Matthew, Luke, and Mark. In Matthew, nothing shall be impossible for us, uh, uh, but we cannot afford to stop. We can't afford to faint. We've got to keep praying. And then in Mark 6, 56, as many as touched him were made whole. Nothing will be impossible is what we're seeing here. So we're going to face some things that are going to utterly seem impossible to us. So, well, we understand that. It's not saying that we'll never face an impossible situation. 
Because we're going to find there's many things that is impossible to us, but for us physically. But if we could learn how to pray, if we could learn how to, to press through and not stop and get a hold of him, I know that if I could but touch him, I will be made whole. We're living in the society today where the struggle is played down and this, uh, the positive confession that we see, this attitude uh, that says that uh, we don't have to lay hold of God, that we don't, there's no fight and there's no pushing and there's nothing uh, that we don't have to push back the forces of darkness, that we don't have to fight against or war against any enemy, that it's, uh, it's just positive confession and it happens. Uh, it, it all, all he has to do is just simply quote a scripture and claim the promise. I had a lady tell me one time, I had started bleeding. She said, well, you need to read Scripture over that. I said, no, I need to apply pressure to that. I said, reading Scripture over that is going to stop the bleeding. God gives us the sense to do the things and, and to be able to do what we need to do. Uh, and people think, well, it's, it's so simple. Just do this. It's so simple. It'll just happen. And what they're doing in that is playing down of the struggle. And what that does uh, is it leaves the church as weak. It leaves the church as impotent. It leaves the, uh, us standing there in the face of the enemy with no ability uh, and no strength. As I said about Paul on Sunday, uh, when Paul ended the end of his race, uh, he didn't say, I preached a good sermon. He didn't say, I sung the good song. He didn't say, I, I built a lot of good tents. Uh, but what he said is, I fought the good fight. And so he was willing to fight against every force of the enemy that was going to come his way against every impossibility. When somebody tells us it's impossible, that should be a challenge to the child of God. Not to prove somebody wrong, but it should be a challenge to us to pray like we've never prayed before and to press in and press beyond that. On one occasion, many were clamoring to be healed, but only those who touched him received, as we read there in Mark 6, 15, 56, uh, they said, if I could but touch his garment, just knew if they could get a hold of him. So we understand something, uh, as we've said already, believing requires effort. Uh, we remember the woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. Anybody remember her? She was in a sad state. She had gone to every physician. She had spent all of her money. Uh, and know what it did her? No good. Uh, matter of fact, Scripture says uh, not only did she not get better, she got worse. Her situation got worse year after year. Uh, she seemed to decline. Uh, but then uh, she came to Jesus, uh, and her testimony was this in Matthew 9 and 21. Uh, she said, if I may but touch his garment, uh, I shall be whole. Uh, so what did she do? She touched him, uh, and she was made whole. Uh, she had to be weak. She had to be almost to the point uh, of total anemic uh, uh, from all the blood loss over 12 years. Uh, but yet, she pressed her way through that crowd and touched him. Have you ever just took a moment to picture that scene, how it must have been? Think of someone frail and fragile and weak. Have you ever lost so much blood that you got lightheaded? Ever been there and lost any blood at all? Yeah, me too. And, and so when you lose that blood and, and there's those that, we don't know. It's, we just know it's an issue of blood. So she could have went to physicians. They couldn't figure it out. So possibly, possibly she had an aneurysm. Possibly she had some internal bleeding and losing blood and not even know it. So imagine the weak state that she was in. And then hear the crowd and, and know the story that Jesus is the healer. And all you got to do is get to him. And if you get to him, it's going to be worth it. And, and she had some belief there, but belief didn't get her healed. She didn't sit there on her couch in her house and say, Oh, I believe that he is the Christ and I believe that he is the healer. Uh, and that's not what got her healing. And then she opens the door, Brother Kevin, when she looks at the door, it's the press, and she's thinking, I know if I can but touch him, I'll be made whole, but how am I going to touch him? It was an impossible situation, Sister Diane, for this weak, frail, uh, fragile woman. And nobody, from, uh, from what I read in Scripture, uh, it don't look like anybody made any effort to get out of her way. Uh, and, and so you picture it any way you want to, but I, I just picture her just beginning to, to try to excuse me, pardon me. Let me get through just that frail little voice. But that didn't work. So then she just drops on all fours, crawling through legs, doing whatever she's got to do. Why? Because if I could touch him, if I could touch him, I'd be made whole. 
And we know that she touched him and she was made whole. That, that should be an image that we get called in our mind. Uh, that Just because uh, uh, we face something impossible uh, and, and we've said, please, Lord. And we've, we've kindly asked and, uh, and, and we've tried to reason with somebody. Whatever the situation is, uh, you've searched for answers. Uh, and, and she was just in an awful situation. Uh, but she said, I know if I can touch him, I could be made whole. Uh, we know that if we could touch the throne room of God, everything's going to be all right. Uh, I, I love that song my my sister used to sing it all the time if my feeble hand of faith could only reach up through this dark and dreary storm of unbelief there's not a press there's not a crowd but there's unbelief there's darkness uh, there, there's outer darkness there's an enemy uh, that's trying to stop us we know if we touch him uh, we know that he's the healer we know that he's the miracle worker uh, we know that he's the way maker uh, we know as Gracie was singing tonight there's no wall he won't kick down there's nothing that he will not do to get to us uh, but are we willing to do that to get to him are we willing to crawl are we willing to fight are we willing to to do whatever it takes well we know if we could touch him we'll be made whole and that's going to take some effort she did that but there's an enemy and let me tell you something about the enemy he's not going away unless you make him go away And how do you make him go away? Well, Scripture tells us how to make him go away. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will go away. He will flee from you. So if if you touch Jesus, you're going to have to run over the devil. You're going to have to plow past him. Matthew 11 and 20, or excuse me, 11 and 12 tells us uh, the violent take it by force. Uh, Daniel, remember him when he was praying, he was desperate. He became desperate for an answer to the problems in his nation. Uh, And for 21 days, Daniel's fasting and then he's praying uh, and he's not hearing a word from God. He's hearing nothing. Imagine that. We, we talk about uh, what ultimately happens, uh, but think about the 21 days when he heard nothing. Are we willing to pray for 21 days and hear nothing? He didn't faint. He didn't stop. Uh, he kept praying, but he heard nothing. And so we you see, he just kept praying. Uh, the angel came to Daniel. You know what the angel told Daniel? Uh, in Daniel 22, 9, 22 and 23, he said, Oh, beloved of God, uh, you were heard the first day. God heard you the first day. And Daniel's thinking, wow, God heard me the first day. That would have been nice to know. But the angel goes on to tell him there was, a, there was an enemy that tried to prevent your answer from getting here. What had happened? Demons had withstood the angels and kept him from getting through. There was a war in the heavenlies, and the message had been delayed. Understand something. God heard you the first time you prayed. There's a miracle in the making for you today. God's working on your situation, and God has already said it as done. It's just that the enemy is fighting against every force that he can and doing everything that he can. If I can just hold them back. He knows he cannot stop the answer from getting to its destination, but he knows us well enough. If he holds back the answer long enough, maybe we'll give up. Maybe we'll walk away. Daniel didn't walk away. Why did Daniel get his victory? Well, number one, because God heard his prayer. God sent the answer, uh, but God hearing his prayer and sending the answer was not enough. It took something on Daniel's part. Uh, It took some stability. Uh, It took some staying there. It took some waiting upon the Lord. Uh, It's taken some, uh, I haven't heard an answer. Uh, How many of us could go uh, 21 days from hearing an answer from God uh, and say, I still believe the answer's coming. Uh, I still believe God's got an answer for me, and he stayed there until the answer came. And so we realize the devil delayed the answer to Daniel, and that's as real today as it was then. If the devil can discourage you, he'll do it. Church too many times has been victimized by an attitude of easy believism. It's, as we said earlier, it's the name of name it and claim it. I like to say, blab it and grab it. Say it done, and it's done, doctrine. Say it done. So so let's put that to practice tonight, okay? $100, $100, $100, $100 bill. Didn't work, right? Just saying it, don't get it done. Just saying it does not make it 
happen. His ways are higher than our ways. And so that doesn't always work. Now, I've had unexpected checks show up in my mailbox. I've had unexpected money show up in my bank account. I've had God move in situations and had God work miracles and come through. So I'm not talking about that. But we have to understand something that we've lost this inner commitment that keeps us on our knees and to know that the only way it's going to happen and so we have these peddlers of this easy believism telling us that if we pray more than once for the same thing, the second time's unbelief. Hell never sold a greater lie than that. We don't have to look any further than Jesus than the blind man to find out that's a lie from the pits of hell. Daniel kept praying. What do you think he prayed on the 20th day? Same thing he prayed on the first day. He prayed until the answer came. Pray until the answer comes. Jesus is there with the blind man, and Jesus uh, laid his hands on the man, and he prayed, and he said to him, uh, ask him what he saw. He said, I see men as trees walking. Well, he wasn't made whole yet, was he? In other words, he was not completely healed. So what did Jesus do? It's going to blow their minds. Jesus prayed again. In Gethsemane, Jesus prayed the same prayer Three times. So if, are we, they accusing or we would be accusing of Jesus of unbelief if we stuck him to that standard? Uh, we find Elijah at Carmel after he had called the fire down from heaven. He slew the false priests and prophets of Jezebel. Uh, now he goes to the mountain to pray for rain. Uh, all the requirements have been met. Uh, this great man of God standing there uh, and he began to pray for rain. Servant went out. Looks like blue skies to me. Comes back to Elijah, I see nothing. Right? Six times he went. I don't know. I don't see anything. The seventh time he came back, and what did he say? I see the cloud about the size of a man's hand. What did Elijah say? That's enough. It's going to rain. He didn't say it was going to rain after the first time. What did he say after the first time? Go back. What did he say after the fourth time? Go back. He had no indication that it was going to rain. He had prayed. I guarantee you, just like with Daniel, God heard him the first time that he prayed for rain. The answer was on the way. Uh, that cloud may have been working its way around the globe. I don't know, to get to where Elijah was. That cloud may have been somewhere in the sky making its way around. Uh, but it was not until uh, he saw that cloud uh, that he had the confidence uh, it's going to rain. Uh, and we have to just believe God uh, and to that point that what we're praying for uh, happens. Uh, he said it's going to rain. Uh, in, in the beginning uh, of that, he didn't know if it would or not. But he just kept going, uh, and he kept believing God. Uh, it wasn't about the number. It wasn't about how many times he went. Uh, it wasn't about uh, how many times he asked God. Uh, Elijah would have just kept on praying. Uh, you know what Elijah would have did? Uh, we, we love the number seven because that's God's perfect number. But you know what Elijah would have told him if he came back? Blue skies. Um, Elijah, I didn't see anything. You know what he would have told him to do? Go back an eighth time. If he had come back to him 11 times, you want to know what he told him to do? Go back a 12th time because I believe God. I believe God. So we can get called up on the numbers and we can get called up on, well, it was because it was seven times and we can get all of that. Uh, Brother Clendenin said the Lord rebuked him on a message that he had preached for many years, the seventh prayer of Elijah. He said, God said to him, I, I've heard enough of that foolishness. Uh, it's, he said, this is my greatest sermon going down the drain. Uh, and God said the answer has nothing to do with seven. Uh, it, it, it had, if it had not rained, Elijah would have done it again. Uh, he knew uh, that he had done what God told him to do. So it was time to open the heavens, and he was not going to let him alone until the heavens were open. Remember Jacob wrestling there? I'm not going to let you go until he bless me. Too many times we let go too quickly. Too many times we, we must pray and faint not, stop not. What did you stop for? Remember the man who had the arrows, and he smote, told him to smote the ground, and he's, 
He said, what are you doing? You should have smote it five or six times. Uh, just be, because of that, you're going to have few victories. Uh, you want some great victory, uh, begin to t- I'll be tearing that ground up. Uh, and, and so we've just got to keep pressing and keep pushing and keep believing and knowing what, the God, what God's Word said. Uh, God said that He bore the stripes at Calvary for our healing. Uh, God said healing was provided in the atonement. Uh, God said that these things will be done. Uh, but yet we sin to say, well, I guess I'm supposed to always be sick. That promise wasn't for me. I guess God didn't want me to do that. We didn't find Daniel doing that for 21 days. He just believed God. We didn't find Elijah doing that after he sent him. He might have said, I keep sending this young man. He's going to think I'm a false prophet after a while. He didn't let that bother him. He knew that God heard his prayer and he knew that God was going to open up the heavens and send rain. Do you know that God heard your prayer? Do you believe in prayer? Do we believe in the possibility of all things being made possible when we pray? Do we we talk about prayer? It's the foundation of the church, but yet it's the least used weapon in our arsenal. Why? Because I don't think many people really believe in the power of prayer. If we believed in the power of prayer, we'd be using it more. And we wouldn't give up so easy. And we would keep going on and on and know that God is going to do it. Now, that name it and claim it crowd, it's left church in a helpless battle. When the church doesn't get an answer, you know what the church does then? They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. I named it and I claimed it and it didn't happen. What do you do then? When, when, you, when you say I'm healed and you're still hurting, what do you do then? Well, that's when the devil can slip in and bring the doubt, uh, making it a place where we begin to doubt what, what the Lord even said. The fathers of the Pentecostal mu- movement many years ago, we, we heard this, some who's been around the church a long time has heard this, prayed, praying through, praying through. You know what that meant? If you know the will of God, don't turn loose until you get an answer. If you know it's the will of God, don't turn loose until you get an answer. Believing that the war was over, some teachers would lead you to believe that all that is necessary is to quote the promise. Merely quoting scriptures, we said earlier, scripture has never produced divine results. We must press until God's thoughts actually become our thoughts. Listen, the mere confession theology has sentenced millions of, of, of to life and defeat because they do not actively resist the devil in any holding, any holding on in prayer whatsoever. There, there is no, I, I spoke it, I said it, it didn't happen. Well, the Lord said there's a prayer closet. There's a praying always. There's a praying and fainting not. There's a pressing in. It's not just, we're, we're, we're the push-button society. I get that. Well, I, I prayed for three minutes, and God didn't do anything. God wants to see how willing you are to press through, maybe. God commands us in Ephesians 4, 27, neither give place to the devil. You know what that tells us? That tells us something about the devil. We know that the devil was defeated at Calvary, but we've also got to know that the victory has to be enforced by us. Just because a victory has been won, the the individual may not realize that. You have to enforce that victory. The devil is hard-headed. He don't realize that he's lost at times, I think. But Satan goes about as a roaring lion. We've heard that quite a bit lately, seeking whom he may devour. And if you don't resist him, he's going to devour you. And so faith demands that we are, are as fervently against the devil as we are for good. We can stand for good. We could stand for a lot of good things. I stand for Jesus. I, I stand, uh, you know, for, for the unborn. I stand, you know, we can take all of these stances. I stand for it. But how willing are we to be able to put our faith, as we've said, against the hindrances? So if we want health, how, what's the best thing for us to do to say, well, I, I believe in health? No, we've got to come against the sickness. Because health is the absence of sickness. 
And in order for sickness to go, we've got to drive the sickness out. What drives the sickness out? The same faith that believes God. The same faith that believes in God is the same faith, as we said, that we put against the hindrance. So the same prayer that is praying to God is the same prayer that is driving out sickness and unbelief in our life. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not stop. And Paul admonished us in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, pray without ceasing. Prayer is not easy. Prayer, if you could use a setting... To think of prayer, prayer is the battleground. Prayer is the battleground. It's that time that we're we're engaged in the fight. Prayer is where we're coming against the enemy with everything in our arsenal. Faith demands that we're fervently against the devil as much as we are for good. But faith in its truest sense is prevailing prayer. Luke 8, 18, 7, and 8, we read this. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which do cry day and night unto him? Though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth. Now, real faith is the ability to hold on. To hold on means the devil is not going to have that child of ours. That's lost or backslid or that loved one. Faith and and holding on means uh, that you're going to be healed. Holding on believes uh, means that. And so when we get saved, we have to put that to action. And we've got to begin to to preach that and proclaim that. uh, And understanding that God is faithful every time uh, that he says that he's going to do it, that he is going to do it. So we have to get to that place no matter what goes on in our lives, uh, no matter what what the circumstances are, we have to realize that Jesus is in control, that he hears our prayer. Nothing shall be possible to us. We'll be put to the test in our lives. We, we find there's so many, so many things, so many testimonies that we can see, that we could share in our lives that, that we knew, oh, that's impossible. That's impossible. Brother Clendenin shares a story of having, of preaching just four years after being saved and, and beginning to preach and had several heart attacks. Had a heart attack while preaching. Took him to the parsonage. Had another heart attack. A nurse uh, said that he, he, was, he had no pulse. Uh, and, and they were saying it's no good. He's just had another heart attack. But his wife would not accept that. His wife didn't believe that. She, uh, she began to keep praying. She just kept holding on to God. Uh, and she began to pray uh, until she began to speak in tongues. He said she spoke in tongues. I heard her in English that God was moving. God raised him up and understand something. He said God didn't heal him there, but God took and, and raised him up, and he told his wife, check me into a hotel room. He stayed in a hotel room for nine days. Nine days, still feeling chest pain, still feeling all, and people say, he should have went to the hospital. He should have went to the doctor. Well, he didn't. He went to prayer. He went to prayer, and on that ninth day, he broke the bed in the hotel room by jumping up and down and proclaiming, I'm healed. He came out of that room healed and preached for many years after that, never a trace. And you know what Brother Clendenin did not die from? Heart trouble. He died many years later in his 80s, but it was not from heart trouble. They told him when he was up in age uh, that he had a heart uh, of a 40-year-old. He was 60, 70 years old. Uh, said, your heart is as strong uh, as any heart. Uh, he took, took medicine uh, and had thrown it in the trash. He just believed God. Uh, why? He knew uh, that God could touch him, uh, and he knew that he could touch God, uh, and that was the only hope. Uh, when we get to that place, I think too many times we put too much confidence in doctors and medicine medicine and all of these things but if we could be like that woman with the issue of blood I know that God can heal me but the question is not can God heal me the question is are we willing to touch God are we willing to push back the doubt are we willing to push through the fear the pain the hardship and the struggle to get to that place and understand it may take nine days of God saying nothing it may take 21 days of seeming like the heavens are brass 
pass. But guarantee, if we will not stop, God will find a way. There's no wall. Gracie couldn't have picked a better song tonight. There's no wall that he won't kick down. There's nothing, nothing that God will not do to get to you. But what are we willing to do to touch God in prayer? There's a thousand demons going to scream in your face. You're going to die right here. That's what happened to Brother Clinton. He said at 3 o'clock in the morning, I came to Psalms 9 and 10. They that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. He, he says here, it did not say, feel thee, see thee, touch thee. He said, seek thee. Nobody could seek him any more than he said, I've been seeking in these nine days. He said, in that moment, that scripture jumped out at me. An assurance that he had not left me was born. He said, I felt like a hand reached inside my chest, squeezed my heart. I jumped straight up, landed on that bed, broke the slats, ran out the hall in my pajamas, shouting and praising God. God had healed me. Why did God heal him? Because he had touched God. He had believed God. And we can do that too. We can touch God. We can believe God. That's the power of prayer. We're, we have to understand something. We are in a war, and we must be prepared to stand fast. We must be prepared to not give place to the devil and don't be intimidated by him. Understand something. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I don't care what you see on the news, social media. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. One of the devil's greatest tricks is to make us to believe that people are our enemy. We believe that. We believe people are our enemy. And when we do that, we begin to resort to carnal weapons. We begin to re uh, resort to name calling. We begin to resort to all kinds of awful things. But when we begin to understand, this is a spiritual battle. And our enemy is spiritual. And therefore, our weapons are also spiritual. What do you mean? Ephesians 6 and 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Wrestling implies hand-to-hand -hand combat. You find something in oriental wrestling, the man who stays on his feet, he's the winner. The last one standing is the winner. So God did not say we ought to wrestle. He said we wrestle. Now that easy believism begins to get us to that place to make men believe that the war is over. But as we said about Paul in 2 Timothy 4 and 7, I fought the fight. I kept the faith. It was the fight of faith. Faith is the ability to stand. Nevertheless, the question is asked, Jesus asked, nevertheless, will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? It's a question we've got to ask ourselves tonight. And those of us who have been in the church for many years and even and knows what this word means, intercessors, some old-fashioned intercessors. Where are they at? Where are the intercessors? Where are those? Where are those that will stay in prayer until the answer comes? Where are those that, that there's been, been times that, that men didn't worry about the fact that people would scan over the service and say, well, I don't see brother so-and-so in service tonight. They didn't worry about that reputation. You know where they were at? In a basement somewhere, in a Sunday school somewhere, praying, getting a hold of God, laying a hold of God for that service because they knew we can't afford for a service to get away. It's not important for somebody to, to see my face, but it is important that I pray. And so they understood that. They were intercessors. Some of the great men of God, we read about Moody and we read about all of those great men, but you know what those great men had? They had an intercessor. Many of those men had a prayer warrior that went into town before they ever got there and just laid on their face before God for days, seeking, seeking what God would do in those meetings. And so where are they at today? You know what? We're... Standing in a place that we need somebody that will begin to stand in the gap and make up the hedge for their family and for their church. Will that be you? Will you be that intercessor? If we refuse to do that, we, and many of the church have, no wonder we're seeing the divorce rate is rampant in our kids. Divorce rate is, is uh, excuse me, the divorce rate is just as high in the church as it is in the world. Kids are hooked on drugs. You know why all this is happening? Because the altars have been forsaken. The prayer calls it. 
It's filled up with junk. There's no room to even get in there and pray. We haven't been in there so long. There's dust in our prayer closets. There's dust on our Bible. Prayer meeting, we know, is the least attended service in any church. And we wonder, what's going on with our world today? If my people will call by my name, will humble themselves and preach and sing and name it and claim it? No, seek my face and pray. Oh, if we could seek his face and pray. We can see some statistics change in church. We can see a shift. We can see something begin to happen in the lives of the people. When we leave the altar and, the, and they understand that when we've left that altar, that the enemy knows that we've left that altar. And, and understand he's trying to destroy our families, but we refuse to let that happen. If we'll return to that altar, there's no situation that we cannot win. There's, our, weapons are not, our weapons are not flesh and blood, but our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. No weapon formed against us is going to prosper. And understand that. Paul fought the beast at Ephesus. The beast was the demon sent by Satan to prevent Paul from from establishing the church. Ephesus was a city given to idolatry, and the devil was determined it would not change. Paul actually fought the devil for that city. He wrestled in prayer with demons who held the city captive. If the Bible teaches us anything, it teaches us that they're lost or held captive by the devil. We, we sing about it, right? And go into the enemy's camp. Take back what he stole from me. They're, they're being held captive. So if the Bible teaches us that, that, that they're being held captive, Satan controls them. We have to understand this, John 6, 44, no man come to God except the Father draw him. So unless the chains are broken through prevailing prayer of saints, the lost cannot come to God. So we've got to begin to pray. We've got to begin to pray that the Lord would convict them. Have you often wondered, Lord, why do we pray for the Lord to save people when it's his desire to save people? Well, he needs to have the church prevailing in prayer and believing that we're going to continue to know that God's going to do what he said he would do, that he's a God of his word. And so as those chains are broken through prevailing prayer, they're not going to come. But when Zion travails, understand something, sons and daughters are going to be born. So when the church prevails, when we travail in prayer, when we prevail in prayer, when we begin to cry out in prayer, he said, there when Zion travails, and he speaks of this as a woman travailing in birth. He's speaking of us travailing just as that woman travailing in birth, and when that birth pains begin to happen, that's an awful thing, I'm sure. I wouldn't want to know nothing about it, but you women know the pain of travailing for that child to be born. And while you're going through that pain, It's uh, probably the most unbearable pain that you've ever faced in your life, and you begin to wonder uh, if you're going to live through it. There's been women who has died uh, because of the agony and the travail uh, of going through that time of birthing that child, that child coming through the birth canal and being born. Uh, But there's no greater moment than when that son or daughter is born, right? When, when that life is brought, oh, we've got to get to that place. It's a painful place. Uh, it's a battleground. You're going to feel like you're going to die. Uh, you're going to feel like you're in a pressing place. Uh, you're going to be like Samson that we talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, that you're going to feel like uh, you, that you're dehydrated, uh, physically drained, uh, and all hope is lost. Uh, a woman told David Wilkerson one time, uh, she said if he was in the spirit, he came from the uh, pulpit from preaching, and she said, I'm exhausted. Uh, she said, well, if you was in the spirit, you wouldn't be exhausted. Uh, That woman didn't have no clue what she was talking about. Uh, We're imperfect vessels, uh, but when we push, uh, allow the Holy Ghost to use these imperfect vessels, uh, I want him to preach me until there's nothing left of me. Uh, I want him to use me uh, to the point that there's nothing left uh, and drained of it. Uh, And when we do that in prayer, uh, he said, when Zion travails, uh, then will sons and daughters be born. You want to see fruit in these 
these altars. Uh, you want to see born again Christians coming into the church? Uh, we've got to get to the place. Uh, we are Zion, uh, and we have to do some travailing. Uh, we're going to have to go through some hardships, some pressing, some battlegrounds, uh, and some struggles. Uh, we're going to get to that point in the fight that we're going to have to reach uh, for the best weapon in our arsenal. Too many people just trying to get through life without having to pull out their best weapon. That's the reality. I, I want to be able to handle it with just a little switchblade. I, I want to be able to, I want to be able to, let, let's just talk things through. You ain't talking nothing through with the devil. It's a battle. You got to run him over. And the only way that you run him over is you get fueled in prayer. And you begin to press in and understand we have a problem. His name is Satan. And we, as the church, must bind him. He said, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. But also what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The failure of God's people to recognize Satan control, Satan's control over the loss has led to the defeat of us winning them. When we begin to say, well, they're not that bad, no, they're bound. I know they're our family. I know that we love them. But we have to admit, they're bound. If they're not saved, they're bound. And I say, oh, mama, oh, brother, I, I don't serve the devil. If you're not serving God, you're serving the devil. There's only two. <laughs> you're serving one or the other. And, well, they know right, and they, they know what is right. I, I get that. But if they're not serving God, they're serving the devil. And they're not, but that does not make them our enemy. Because somebody is out there serving the enemy and refused to serve God, and, and they mark themselves up with all the things of the world and talk like the world and act like the world, we've got to remember something. They're bound they're in captivity, and they're under the full control of the enemy. And there's only one way to break that. Prayer. Prayer. We can go slap them upside the head. That ain't going to work. We want to, right? We want it to work. We just want to knock Jesus in them. That won't work. And we want to do all of those things. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. All the things that we think will work will not work. But prayer still works works. Prayer still works. Nothing shall be impossible if we pray. Resist the devil. He's going to flee from you. Turn your faith against Satan, his sickness, his fear, and you will win. In closing tonight, you've got to become violent. Pastor's calling us to be violent. Yes, we've got to become violent. I'm not asking you to burn nothing. I'm not asking you to tear nothing down. But I'm telling you that you've got to be violent in prayer. We can pray, Lord, help us. Lord, bless us. Give us this day, our daily bread. All of those are wonderful prayers. But we've also got to come against the forces of hell. Why would we continue in our prayer closet, muttering words that are not adding up to anything when we know that there's a force there hindering us. If, there, if there's something there hindering you, if, Brother Kevin, if you were standing there trying to talk to me and there was a dog just yapping there at your ankles, biting on your ankles, what would you do? Would you just keep keep that conversation, try to keep eye contact and let that dog just tear your leg apart? No, you do something about the dog. Prayer is very much talking to God, but prayer is also very much doing something about the hindrances that's trying to prevent you from praying. There are certain hindrances that we can control. We can not take the cell phone into the prayer closet with us. We can, if you have a house phone still, take it off the hook. You can inform the kids, I'm going to pray, don't bother me. Unless it's absolutely important, don't bother me. So there's certain hindrances that you can take care of. But then there's those spiritual hindrances that the devil loves to begin to get in your mind. 
and begin to have it going a thousand different ways. Can I tell you, it is okay to stop when you're praying because you're not getting anywhere anyway when you're just muttering words, but your mind's way over here. Pull all that together. Rebuke the enemy. Say, this is my prayer closet. You're not welcome here. This is my prayer closet. This is my refuge. This is where I lay hold of God. And it's hard to lay hold of God when the devil's right there hindering you and preventing you. But he's given us power over the enemy. He has given us power over the enemy. I've got loved ones that need to be saved. And I can't afford to let all these hindrances stay in my way. Well, the devil says, well, you know what you're praying there is really impossible. Get out. When, you, when you're praying and you're, you're believing God for something, and, and you've got a situation, it's an impossible situation, and you know it's impossible. I love this about the story of Elijah and Elijah. They're fixing to go over that final, go over the Jordan. Sons of the prophets, they've told him this several times. You know he's going to leave you. They said, he's going to leave you today. And you know what Elijah said? I know. Hold your peace. These were sons of the prophets. These weren't devils. They were being used by the devil. They were looking at him. He's going to be taken from you. He said, hold your peace. I already know that. That's not my focus. My focus is not on Elijah leaving me today. My focus is on the double portion of anointing that's going to be left when he does go. So it's all about perspective. He said, I know he's leaving. I know the situation. I know that when I get to the other side, that it's his anointing that's getting us to the other side. And when I get over there, it's going to be impossible for me to get back. But I'm not looking at the impossible. Because I've followed him all these eight years for the double portion of the anointing that the impossible becomes possible. Imagine the look on their faces when those waters split. And it wasn't Elijah coming across, but it was Elisha. Elijah was sure enough gone. They saw the chariot go up just like he did, I'm sure. But here he came back across. That's impossible. Yes, with man, it's impossible. With God, all things are made possible. Why? Because Elijah was willing to not stop not stop. I'm going all the way. So are we willing to go all the way? Faint not. Father, help us tonight to apply these truths to our lives. Nothing's impossible. But we seem to find a lot of impossible scenarios and situations and circumstances that we think is impossible and we're told is impossible. So we just deem them as impossible and chalk it up. Well, That's not even possible, so I give up. Lord God, help us to wait until we've heard from you. What do you say about these impossibilities? Is it something that you want to fulfill? Is it something you want to accomplish? We look at some people and we say it's impossible that they'll ever be saved. And then you save them and they become great ministers of the gospel. Or we just see too many times that you've taken the impossible and did wonderful things with it. I pray, God, that you would do that tonight as we approach these altars to pray. Help us tonight to come against the impossible with diligent, persevering faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you meet me in these altars tonight? And let's see if we can prevail in prayer. Whatever it is, whoever it is you need to pray for, let's press through until we get an answer tonight.